Hello and welcome back to another video with It's Dr. Dan and today we're going to be learning about heating and cooling curves. Now what these are used for is that in thermochemistry we like to illustrate how things uh, or substances absorb or release. So this is typically showing how phase changes occur and how essentially being absorbed or released. So what does this kind of look like? Well the heating curves and cooling curves can be shown in a Number of ways. So the first one is essentially if I have something that's heating, these are usually shown as a sloped line going upwards. So heating, as you can see here, uh, as temperature is changing. So as it's going up, so you can kind of imagine like if I have a really low TI, it's going to a very high TF. So when we're using these heating curves, we'll usually use our MCAT equation illustrate that change as it's going from one location to another. So slopes use the M category. Now same thing for cooling. Cooling is the exact same idea, right? We're going to have a slope, but instead it's going to go the opposite way, right? It's going downward as a result. So whenever we have a downward slope, generally the Q value turns out to be negative mathematically. Um, the reason is is because your TI is going to be a lot greater than the TF. So essentially you'll get a negative value from this versus the other one from before. Um, TF is greater than TI. So it's all depending on kind of what you're seeing value and where you're starting, right? So T up here, TF is kind of down this way. Now, when you have a phase change to represent this, well, if you can kind of remember the equations for those, Usually we use uh, Q is equal to N times delta H of either the fusion or vaporization, so one or the other. So there is no delta T value or temperature in that calculation at all. So if you kind of think of this plot, well, it's only temperature and energy. So if temperature is not changing, how should we plot it? Well, in this case, what we would end up doing is we would show a plateau or a flat line. So a plateau versus a slope for the other value. Okay, so slopes for the cooling and heating curves and a plateau for the phase change. So phase changes could be like boiling, they can be freezing, they can be um, condensation, they can be um, evaporation. It just depends on like what exactly it is that you're looking at with all together essentially if i were to try to show like a heating curve from like ice to steam it can look a little bit like this so notice how i have many different slopes many different plateaus that are here so to kind of like label them as different regions so let's just call them like a b um c d and e just kind of labeling them by their their slopes and plateaus so remember that whenever we see these slopes represent heating so it's going up changing plateaus are phase changes so whenever we have let's say any of those slopes that's when we'll use a q is equal to mc delta t and then plateaus are using one of the different phase change formulas whether it's q is equal to n times delta diffusion or n times delta vaporization. So whenever we're seeing these, right, all of these will have their own different energy value associated with them. So if I'm kind of looking at the first one, which is A, right, it's a rise in temperature, and that's where you essentially have ice is absorbing its energy up here. So at the very top. So that what that's going to tell us is essentially that ice value is going to have its own unique C value for ice because ice is going to act differently, let's say water or as steam. So, what we'll use is that Q equals MCAT. The B area, so this would be like Q is one. B, which is Q2 or second heat, is going to be essentially how it's going to change in phase. So, you can see it's a, it takes a long time for all those bonds to kind of finally break apart going from ice to a full-on liquid 
If you kind of ever thrown, let's say, an ice cube in water, you know how it takes like a really long time usually for it to melt if they're about the same temperature? Well, that's because all those molecules, they're stuck together. They're really, really cold. They don't have a lot of energy to do that. So it's difficult for them to try to release from one another. Um, essentially, then when we have, have three, we can see that this is the Q3 area and Q4 and so on. And every part represents a different story of how we can read it and see what the data is showing. Okay, so sorry, this is Q3, Q4, and Q5. Now, why do we care about all these different heats? Well, if we were trying to solve, let's say, a problem like this one, then we needed to figure out, well, what, how much heat does it take to go from one spot to the other? Well, this is when essentially you, to do the, the total energy, you'd have to add up all these individual parts. We'd have to take Q1, add it to Q2, add it to Q3, and so on as you're kind of going through all these problems, which can be a really long, hard, and difficult problem um, as you're trying to really see like, okay, what is it that I'm trying to solve? So this is what we're actually going to be doing at the end at the end of the video is seeing this but before we do that we're going to actually illustrate what these phase changes look like on the molecular picture so i have an example to show you up right up right up here all right so in this tutorial i grabbed this from essentially a free simulation software from the university of colorado which goes through many different types of examples so right here we have neon so a noble gas and when it's really really cold it actually can become a solid now, when it's a noble gas, these things don't take a lot of heat from the break apart. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to raise the heat so you can see a little fire coming apart. And what you notice is that the molecules are moving around more. So when we do that, right, we're increasing kinetic energy as a result. So you can see it went from 14 to 22 Kelvin. It's not a big change, but there's more energy. And when that happens, you can kind of see like, oh, these guys are starting to break apart as a result. Right, so it's starting to kind of transition to more of like a liquid as a result, so it's kind of melting. So if we raise it a little bit more, right, so not much, but what we're going to actually see is it's going to all start falling apart. This is what we refer to as it's becoming a, going from a solid to a liquid. So you notice how it was one big cube and now it's kind of being spread throughout all the bottom. And being that we're still not quite at the place where gases are only gases, you can see where things are actually vaporizing. So kind of like how uh, when you, it's like the morning dew in the morning when it's con condensed all over like grass and leaves. But over the day as it heats up, it, it starts to just disappear. Well, that's vaporization, right? It's not getting to a boiling point, but it gets enough energy that it can actually break into a gas. But it's all about how fast are these guys moving? So if I kind of increase the temperature by like maybe another 10, 20 degrees, you can see, okay, now they're all gas particles moving around freely, bouncing all over they want. And you can kind of notice that there's still some liquid here at the bottom for a little while until I start increasing. It takes a lot of energy to make that phase change fully happen. So that's the plateau and the slopes. Let's take a look at a different molecule. Okay, so this is solid water. This is what a water molecule looks like when it is in its, uh, when it's an ice. So you can see everything is what we refer to as its hydrogen bonded together, which is something that we're going to talk about in a few, in a, soon in other videos. Now, when in this phase, this is when ice cubes like they still move and vibrate when they're in this phase. So it's at 146 Kelvin or negative 127 degrees C. So the freezing point is at zero. So you can still see it's, a, it's an ice cube. So they're still moving at the molecular level. So if I heat this up pretty slowly, you can still see the ice cube starts to expand. It's still heating up. So this is where the slope is, right? We're going in a heating curve direction. Now, as I get closer and closer to zero degrees, notice how it's starting to spread apart, right? They're still really close together, but now it's kind of starting to look more like a liquid, right? Things are starting to move and try to travel over each other as a result. And if I heat it up a little bit more, the molecules are going to start sliding across each other and moving and really aren't that much of a solid anymore. And it takes a lot of effort and work for that to happen. 
Now, if I heat that up to about, let's say, body temperature, so right where kind of our bodies are, is about maybe 35, 36, 37, you'll be able to see probably some molecules might go into the gas phase or get knocked off, but most of it's still liquid, right? So inside of you, right? So that's why we are water-based life forms. If we went any higher and we lost our water, that'd be really bad. But if it gets too hot, let's say around 100 degrees C, or right where the boiling point is right here, you'll see, okay, this is where steam starts coming from, but we still have our liquid. And if I go a little bit beyond that, you'll see this is where steam will start kind of coming up and we'll have our molecules be really excited and turn into little gas particles, okay? So we have steam that's kind of going all over the place. I just want to kind of show you guys what slopes and plateaus kind of look like on a molecular. Let's take a look at our final example for, for these videos. All right, our one example for this video is how much total energy is required to heat one kilogram of ice at negative 50 degrees C to steam at 130 degrees Celsius. The specific heats are for ice and for liquid water and steam are all listed below. And we also have the enthalpies for both fusion and vaporization listed. So these are going to be all your Q values that you have here. So one thing I mentioned before is that the total Q value is all of the different formulas essentially all added up and listed together. So let's try to go through this as quickly as we can to show this. So how would we do it? Well, being that we have a Q value, right, and it's all, the first one is a slope. So one kilogram of water is being heated. So being that we have um, one thing earlier is this is the same slope from before. Um, so with that being said, right, if we want to do our blue portion, we're going from negative 50 to zero degrees. So our final is zero, negative 50 is our first part. So what we will do is we'll times that by the specific heat of ice which in this case, I have it in kilojoules per kilogram to save on us doing some conversions. And that's going to be essentially zero minus negative 50 degrees. And what that's going to become for your Q1 is you're going to have one times 2.03 times 50. So we're going to get 101.5 kilojoules of heat for the first slope. Right, so using that M cat equation. For Q2, this is a plateau. So this is when the water boils. So being once again, we are looking at uh, using our uh, kilogram of liquid. So we have a one kilogram that is being used here. So when we are trying to use this, we can quickly convert it to grams for ourselves because we have to use the molar mass. So 1,000 grams. We're going to times that by the molar mass, which is 18 grams over one mole for water. Um, and then we are going to, um, to convert that as well using the enthalpy of fusion, which is 6.00 kilojoules for every mole. All right, now when we do that, what we are going to get is 333.3 kilojoules. That's a lot of energy for Q2. Notice how much more energy it took to do a phase change instead of just heating ice up. There is a big difference trying to get over that hump and for it to finally become what it needs to do. So let's kind of keep track of all this for ourselves. So we're going to have 101.5 kilojoules, and we're going to add that plus 330 3.3 kilojoules. Okay, the next part. So Q3 is heating up again. This is going from zero to 100 degrees. So when we are doing that, once again, we have our one kilogram, so 1.00 kilograms. We're going to times that by C of water, which is 4.184. So where are we looking for that value? That's coming from right here, right? So we're on the liquid portion of the slope. Just to show that, right? We did the plateau. Now we're going from here to here. So it's at 100 to zero. All right. So when we have that, so one kilogram times 
And this is in kilojoules over grams, uh, kilograms by Celsius times 100 degrees C is our change in this case. Now, when we do 1 times 100 times 4.184, we're going to get 418 kilojoules per Q3. Okay, so we're going to add that in here to 418 kilojoules. Change all that to pink to match. And now for the purple part, which is our next plateau, or the vaporization, which as you can see here, look how much energy this requires for this to happen. To turn something into a gas requires the most. It's kind of like when a liquid wants to be a gas, it's kind of like ripping you away from all your friends, like you want to hang out with them, you don't want to leave. Well, it's kind of the same idea here. So we have our 1,000 grams of our liquid. We're going to turn that once again into moles, just like we did before. And then we're going to convert that using our heat of vaporization, which is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay, now when we do that, what we're going to get is 2,000. 260 joules of energy for that portion of the equation, which is the most out of any of them. And then for our last part, which is once again another slope, we're going to take that one kilojoule, times it by the specific heat of steam, just two kilojoules per kilogram for Celsius. And being that we're going from 130 to 100, or, or 100 to 130, sorry. This is going to be a difference of 30 degrees C, which is going to equal 60.0 kilojoules of energy. And what we are going to do is we're going to add up all of these little pieces together. So, and that's going to make our total energy as a result. So we're going to take 101.5 plus 333.3 plus 418 plus 2260 plus 60 kilojoules. And once we do all that, we're going to get a massive value of 3,172.1 kilojoules of energy. That's a lot. That's a lot of energy. So to kind of put that in perspective, if you wanted to have that in joules, that would be about um, 170. So let's say if we were to round that to the proper sig figs, that would be 10 to the 6 power of joules. So that is a lot. Um, now, I always get asked this question, like, is this kind of thing on an exam? Usually not this long. It's like maybe a part of it would be reasonable. So like if you had to do just one of the energy calculations, maybe one of the parts, how to read the slopes, how to read the plateaus, what do they show? Just pieces. Maybe adding two parts together like how we did in the heat of fusion, heat of vaporization video. This one is a very long problem that's typically done as maybe a homework problem for like one homework problem where it might take you a while to do it, but it's practicing all your pieces adding together. All right, I hope this video helped and thank you so much for listening and I'll see you all later. Bye now.